I'm Adam Fleming and this is Politics UK. Welcome to your weekly roundup of political and parliamentary highlights. I'll be joined by our correspondent in Cardiff and here in Westminster by our parliamentary correspondent, David Cornock. On the programme this week. Sir Keir Starmer sets out his pitch to voters, telling Labour's annual conference he's the right person to lead the country. There's no magic wand here. A decade of national renewal. That's what it will take. We will need ambition, determination, patience, absolutely, but also bravery. Labour's Rachel Reeves says her party can be trusted to keep a tight grip on spending. Change will only be achieved on the basis of iron discipline. Working people rightly expect nothing less. And with NHS waiting lists at a record high, there's a strong message to conference about the need for reform. I argue that our NHS must modernise or die, not as a threat, but a choice. The crisis really is that existential. Hello. Well, this was the week of the Labour Party conference in Liverpool. The event was overshadowed by the harrowing events in Israel. And we'll hear what Keir Starmer had to say about the attack in his speech in a moment. But David, before we do that, this is probably the last party conference before the general election. A big moment, but not necessarily a moment that, that went to plan for Keir Starmer. Not entirely, Adam. As you know, these events are choreographed so precisely from the entrance, the walk-on music, uh, Lionheart Fearless in this case, in case you were wondering, and they are timed to the second, but sometimes things go wrong. Now, Keir Starmer isn't the first party leader to have his big conference speech disrupted, but he is possibly the first politician to be glitter-bombed by someone campaigning for voter reform. Yeah, and he pushed him away, and then the security bundled, bundled the guy down to the floor and he was driven off in a police van. Quite, quite a long gap between him arriving on stage and security doing the bundling, some people might say. Um, I was in the hall, you could hear a massive kind of gulp of anguish that sort of like lasted a little while because people were worrying about the security implications of this. Absolutely, and there are certainly questions to answer there. Now, Keir Starmer uh, did look momentarily startled, as you would be, uh, but he was possibly, I think, one of the calmest people in the room, stirred but not shaken, if, if you like. Um, he told us later he wasn't going to let one idiot spoil his speech. Now, he was covered in glitter, not the easiest thing to remove, but a party worker came up and said, I'm taking your jacket off. Um, Keir Starmer rolled up his sleeves and he used the interruption to make a point. Thank you, conference. Thank you. Thank you, conference. If he thinks that bothers me, he doesn't know me. <laughs> Protest or power, that's why we changed our party, conference. That's why we changed our party. And that idea of, of, that Keir Starmer had moved the Labour Party from being one of protest to one ready for power was, was a big theme of the speech. What were the other big themes? Mm. Now, at the start of the week, Keir Starmer said he had one big question to answer that week. And why as why Labour? Now, given Labour are not promising to tax and spend that much more than the Conservatives, there was no real policy blitz to dangle before the voters. But one thing struck me, and that was the focus on house building. Now, We've both heard, haven't we, over the years, political leaders announce they're going to build this many homes only to have to row back when voters decide they don't really want them in their backyard. Now, Keir Starmer thinks he's got a plan to get around this. He's promising a million and a half homes in England. Um, he's promising to do that, uh, bulldozing through planning regulations as he sees it. And um, that bulldozer might take out a few Labour MPs on the way as well, if need be. Um, he's promising four new towns in England. We don't know where they'll be or exactly how they'll be built, but you can see the direction of travel there. Now, as you say, this 
was a conference overshadowed by events in the Middle East. Often, it has to be said, a sensitive area for Labour in recent years, given the issues with anti-Semitism under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. This is how Keir Starmer handled the issue. Conference, I am shocked and appalled by the events in Israel. I utterly condemn the senseless murder of men, women and children, including British citizens, in cold blood by the terrorists of Hamas. This party... <laughs> this party believes in the two-state solution, a Palestinian state alongside a safe and secure Israel. But this action by Hamas does nothing for Palestinians, and Israel must always have the right to defend her people. <laughs> Conference, these events, the war in Ukraine, they show precisely the test of our era. The world is becoming a more volatile place. Revolutions in energy, science, technology are reshaping the global economy. The race is on for the new jobs, the new supply chains, the new industries that will emerge. Climate change is a recipe for instability. We've seen that on our TV screens all summer. Terrorism, the movement of people, criminal gangs who exploit their vulnerability, they're all challenges we must confront. People are looking at us because they want our wounds to heal, and we are the healers. People are looking to us because these challenges require a modern state, and we are the modernizers. People are looking to us because they want to build a new Britain, and we are the builders. If you think our job in 1997 was to rebuild a crumbling public realm, that in 1964 it was to modernise an economy left behind by the pace of technology, that in 1945 to build a new Britain out of the trauma of collective sacrifice, then in 2024, it will have to be all three. All three. <laughs> the non-DOM tax status is a legal loophole that allows some of the richest people in the world to avoid paying tax in Britain. That's money we could invest in our NHS. That's always been our priority. And right now, the biggest challenge is cutting waiting lists. So we will invest that money in boosting capacity. We will get the NHS working around the clock and we will pay staff properly to do it. More operations, more appointments, more diagnostic tests. You will be seen more clearly in an NHS clearing the backlog seven days a week. But conference, conference do not doubt the hard road either because if all we do is place the NHS on a pedestal, then I'm afraid it will remain on life support. I know some people don't like the word reform, but I tell you now, there's no other option. We must be the government that finally transforms our NHS. We, we can't go on like this. We can't go on with a sickness service. We need an NHS that prevents illness, keeps people healthy and out of hospital in the first place. Here's the bigger lesson. Because what is true of our NHS is true right across the board. We're not here to manage the shop. We're here to make government more dynamic, more joined up, more strategic, focused at all times and without exception on long-term national renewal. Mission government. It's not about size, it's about capacity. A more powerful engine, not a bigger car. A reforming state, not a checkbook state. Now, people will say, don't rock the boat. We've always done it like this. Is this really necessary? I've reformed a public service before. I know how it goes. But it's our responsibility to do it. We used to call it the dream of home ownership, didn't we? We used to say it glibly on stages like this. But look at Britain now. It has become a dream. It's out of reach for millions. And if we don't take action, 
it will only become more distant, a luxury for the few, not the privilege of the many. So today we launch a new plan to get Britain building again, a signal of our determination to fight the blockers who hold a veto over British aspiration. No more land bankers sitting comfortably on brownfield sites while rents in their communities rise. No more councils refusing to develop a local plan because they prefer the backdoor deal. No more inertia in the face of resistance, and there will be resistance, from people who say, no, we don't want Britain's future here. My message to them is this. A future must be built. That is the responsibility of serious government. And no, this doesn't mean we're tearing up the green belt. Labour is the party that protects our green spaces. No party fights harder for our environment. We created the national parks, created the green belt in the first place. I grew up in Surrey. But where there are clearly ridiculous uses of it, disused car parks, dreary wastelands, not a green belt, a grey belt, sometimes within a city's boundary, then this cannot be justified as a reason to hold our future back. If you are a Conservative voter who despairs of this, if you look in horror at the descent of your party into the murky waters of populism and conspiracy with no argument for economic change, if you feel our country needs a party that conserves, that fights for our union, our environment, the rule of law, family life, the, the careful bond between this generation and the next, then let me tell you, Britain already has one, and you can join it. It's this Labour Party. <laughs> Unlike the Tories, we won't be dragged back to the easy answers. The barriers of dogma will not block our path. That's why we hold out the hand of partnership to business, champion the need for a competitive tax regime, understand that private enterprise is the only way this country pays its way in the world. <laughs> why Labour? Because we serve your interests. Why Labour? Because we will grow every corner of our country. Why Labour? Because we have a plan to take back our streets, switch on great British energy, get the NHS back on its feet, tear down the barriers to opportunity and get Britain building again. A plan for a Britain built to last, a plan to heal the wounds, a plan to turn the page and say, in a cry of defiance to all those who now write our country off, Britain must, Britain can, Britain will get its future back. Thank you, conference. Thank you, conference. Thank you. Thank you. And then the traditional photo op at the end. Um, now, earlier in the week, David, Rachel Reeves had made her pitch to be the next Chancellor. What was the pitch? Adam, most conference speeches, especially just before an election, are aimed at two audiences, aren't they? There's the one in the hall and there are the voters at home. So from Rachel Reeves, we had lots of reassuring noises that she was going to look after your money, the nation's money, as carefully as she would her own. She talked of iron discipline in her approach to the public finances. Now, some people thought iron discipline, iron lady, Margaret Thatcher. I thought there was an air of Gordon Brown mid-90s about the speech in its uh, fiscal resilience, if you, if you like. Uh, she was introduced by the businesswoman Mary Porters and delegates were also played a video of the former Bank of England governor, Mark Carney, who endorsed her approach. Labour very pleased with that. Let's hear from Rachel Reeves now. Labour's defining economic mission is to restore growth to Britain. But it is no use simply claiming that we want economic growth without new ideas for how we can achieve it. That starts with understanding the world as it is today. A world that has been reshaped by new technologies, by the pandemic, 
by war, by great power rivalries, and by the climate crisis. A change world demands a new business model for Britain. It is an approach that I call Securonomics. That means government putting economic security first. Security for family finances and security for our national economy. It means we must rebuild our ability to do, make and sell more here in Britain. So we are less exposed to global shocks. Governments around the world have come to understand this in a way that our governments cannot. That wealth does not just trickle down from a few at the top, but rests on the contribution of the many. On the skill and dedication of those who work in our everyday economy. Care workers, postal workers, supermarket workers. And on entrepreneurs, innovators and scientists. Growth from the bottom up and the middle out, an economy rebuilt in the interests of working people. <laughs> Conference, I do not underestimate the scale of the task ahead of us, nor the problems we would inherit in government. They demand hard work, determination and tough decisions. The exhaustion of conservative ideas does not give us the freedom to push through programmes detached from our present economic reality or take for granted those people who we seek to represent. Change will only be achieved on the basis of iron discipline. Working people rightly expect nothing less. But let me address directly those who say that to make hard choices is to make the same choices as the Tory party. To them, I say, economic responsibility does not detract from advances for working people. It is the foundation upon which progress is built. Hard choices, but labour choices. The choice to back our high streets and small businesses by requiring online tech giants to pay their fair share. The choice to levy a proper windfall tax on the huge profits that the energy giants are making. And another choice. In my first budget as Chancellor of the Exchequer, I will end the tax loophole which exempts private schools from paying VAT and business rates. Conference, we will put that money into helping the 93% of our children who are in our state schools. Today, the costs, the costs to the taxpayer of COVID fraud is estimated at £7.2 billion, pounds, with every single one of those cheques signed by Rishi Sunak as Chancellor. And yet, just 2% of all fraudulent COVID grants have been recovered. So I can announce today that we will appoint a COVID corruption commissioner supported, <laughs> supported by a hit squad of investigators equipped with the powers they need and the mandate to do whatever it takes. The post of Chancellor of the Exchequer has existed now for 800 years. In that time, not one single woman has held that post. Conference, when we next meet, I intend to address this hall as Britain's first female Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> if you, like me, believe that it is time to put security first and reject the risk of five more years of chaos and decline, then join us. Join us in our mission to rebuild Britain. Join us in our mission to give Britain its future back, creating new jobs, driving down bills, reviving our high streets, 
rescuing our public services, more teachers in our schools, more police on our streets, more doctors and nurses in our hospitals, lifting families from poverty, achieving energy security and bringing growth back to Britain. We are here, ready to serve, ready to lead, and together we can and we will rebuild Britain. Rachel Reeves there. David, thank you very much. But come back and talk to us more about Labour Party conference because it did last for five days. There was more. Right, to the Senate now, where the issue of extra money for HS2 came up again. And party leaders also gave their thoughts on the ongoing situation in Israel and Gaza. Our Wales political correspondent, Rodri Lewis, is in Cardiff Bay for us. Hi, Rodri. Uh, what do the party leaders have to say about the Middle East? Well, yes, hi, Adam. They were invited to... Uh to outline their reaction to events in Gaza and Israel at the beginning of the session on Tuesday. And as you might expect, the four party leaders denounced the violence and we heard first from the First Minister, Mark Drakeford. We condemn, of course, the perpetrators of these attacks, which have taken the lives of so many innocent civilians. But condemnation alone is not enough. A two-state solution is the policy of the UK government and of the United Nations. Beyond the horror of the coming days, the international community must come together to work again for a lasting peace, a secure peace, a peace which reaches into the everyday lives of the Israeli and the Palestinian people. And the one image I would ask all members to reflect on is the image on the front page of the Times today of a family of three young children, a father and a mother, who were slaughtered, who were slaughtered on the weekend because they happened to be Israelis. That is something that none of us, none of us should stand by and condone, and we must make sure that we redouble our efforts to support Israel's right of self-determination, to protect its borders, we support the civilians in the Palestinian community who abhor what Hamas is doing, supposedly in their name, which I would argue is not being done in their name, and make sure that we stand shoulder to shoulder where this violence is inflicting such multiple misery and suffering so that we can enjoy the peace that the First Minister's talked about and the peace that we all want to see. We have condemned the attacks by Hamas and today we urge the international community to work together swiftly to persuade the relevant powers to introduce a ceasefire fire to allow the release of those held in Gaza against their will. We also believe that the way that the Israeli government has placed Gaza under siege, ceasing water and energy supplies is impossible to justify. Ordinary Palestinians, of course, have been let down by the international community and have suffered years of violence and injustice. Now, people on both sides of the border are losing their lives again in heartbreaking circumstances. Worsening the violence is not the solution. We fully condemn the terrorism of Hamas and Islamic Jihad. I echo the comments of Leila Moran, the Liberal Democrat spokesperson of, on foreign affairs, and herself of Palestinian descent, who said that civilians must be protected and we are especially horrified to hear about hostage taking and we condemn all of the violence. This is sadly a significant escalation. The United Nations said, in conflict, civilians always pay the highest price. War is not the answer. We need peace. And after that, the Llawydd, or presiding officer, Aileen Jones, said all the leaders had called for peace and she was sure that the whole Senate would agree with that. But, Rodri, after all that unity, there was then the return of normal politics. Yes, indeed, with the weekly session of questions to the First Minister. Now, the Plaid Cymru leader, Huynap Yorwerth, asked what the Welsh Government would do about no extra money coming to Wales as a result of the HS2 line being built 
from London to Birmingham. And that's because it's been classified as an England and Wales project at the moment. Though obviously none of the new track will be laid anywhere near here. Now that means that Wales doesn't get any extra money to spend, known as a consequential, which could be worth around £2 billion. Now, Labour says we'll have an HS2 inquiry if it wins power in Westminster, but we in Wales are owed a cheque, not the kicking of a can down the tracks at the expense of our transport networks. The FM himself says that uh, Wales is um, being cheated over this issue, but Labour won't take action. When the boss of Unite accused Labour of being too timid, I wonder if the First Minister believes that she was referencing Labour's attitude towards HS2 in Wales. Well, first of all, uh, let me say again, it is the view of the Welsh Government, as it is the view of parties across this chamber, that Wales deserves our share of the funding that has been invested in HS2. Uh, it, that should have been the case from uh, the beginning, had the Treasury not decided to interpret the rules in a way that uh, no one else uh, is able to uh, understand. <laughs> An incoming Labour government, as I've explained many times now on the floor of the Senate, is going to inherit an economic set of circumstances that means that no responsible party is going in the run-up to an election to be offering to sign cheques for the very, very many causes which will be put to that government, all of which I'm sure will have merit. It's exactly the same economic circumstances in which you say the Conservatives should be paying up uh, consequentials. You're, you're, you're right, you know, the government is uh, uh, stressing time and time again that Wales is owed this money. I'm grateful for a response I've received from the Council General uh, today to a question I asked uh, asking uh, what legal avenues are available to the Welsh Government to challenge the UK's Government to classify HS2 Rail as an England and Wales project. And in that response, uh, as well as saying that, yes, as, as we would argue, the decision to cancel the Birmingham <coughs> to Manchester HS2 routes makes the case even clearer that HS2 is an England-only project, the Council General says uh, that Welsh Government is considering all options available, including legal avenues, to challenge the decision to classify HS2 as an England and Wales project. Given the Council General's response, could we therefore assume that if Keir Starmer does become Prime Minister, that the Labour Government in, in Wales is also willing to launch a legal challenge against the Labour Government at Westminster? Well, I'm afraid there are so uh, many ifs and buts uh, in that question that it's impossible to give him uh, a sensible uh, answer. The answer that was given to the question is the right question to ask. In the current circumstances, of course, we continue to explore all the avenues that are available to us. Some of those may be legal. So this long-running saga continues with the suggestion there that it could end up being decided by the courts. And if not, ultimately, of course, it'll be down to the UK government to decide whether or not to open its chequebook. And, Roger, we heard about a new plan to tackle homelessness. Yes, indeed. Uh, ministers announced a new plan to end homelessness in Wales, with the latest figures showing that 12,500 people in Wales are being supported across Wales in the area, in this particular area, during the past year. Uh, and that figure's gone up, unfortunately, by 7%. Uh, since last year. Now, the Welsh Government has consulted a panel of experts, and the main thrust of the new strategy is a push to prevent homelessness, and if that can't happen, to bring about early intervention to help. I'm sure many of my colleagues in the Chamber today have, in their constituency roles, responded to people who are struggling with homelessness. I'm sure some of them have been in crisis, experiencing homelessness that could have been prevented. Our proposals will mean that public services will work together to identify and prevent homelessness before it happens and to work with people to ensure lasting positive outcomes. Some of you may have been asked to help people refuse to homelessness service because they aren't deemed to be in priority need or have been, have found, have been found to have made themselves intentionally homeless. Our proposals mean that such tests will be abolished. You may have tried to help people with multiple support needs traverse a complicated system to get the help they need. Our proposals target those most at risk and require a range of public bodies to cooperate to help keep people in their homes. Ending homelessness is not just about providing a roof over a person's head. It is about addressing the wide range of causes and consequences of homelessness and of finding the right accommodation in the right place at the right time. Now, for three decades nearly, you in Welsh Labour have been responsible for housing. Yes, for building houses. 
to, you know, so that our, our people, our constituents, have homes to live in. Look what you have achieved. 10,931 individuals now living in temporary accommodation. That is the highest level since the Welsh Government began its current monitoring programme. It is a disgrace. 3,350 dependent children under the age of 16 living in temporary accommodation. A third who are in hotels or B&Bs. That is a disgrace. Rough sleeping has increased by 69% since July 2021. That is a disgrace. Housing support grant. The funding is due to remain the same as last year, with £166.7 million allocated. That's a real terms cut of 8%. We do have very large numbers in temporary accommodation, Janet. Those people would be on the street if they lived in England, let's be clear. If you, in, if you want to keep priority need, that is a way of keeping people out of accommodation and on the street. If you don't understand that fundamental, I just don't know where to start with you. The idea that the solution to this is to allow landlords to rent homes that are not fit for human habitation in order to stop you having to look at somebody my on the street yeah. is for the birds. Honestly, can I suggest you actually read the uh, advice of the Homelessness Advisory Panel and of the expert group? And can I suggest that you, for once, listen to the lived experience of the people in the system? Because what they're saying and what you just said are literally poles apart. A rather prickly response from the Minister there, but there have, of course, been numerous strategies down the years, and the Conservatives are pointing out that it's Labour that have controlled this policy since devolution started. So the success or failure of any plans during that time have always been down to them. Rodri Lewis in Cardiff, thank you very much. Now, David, shall we return to the Labour Party conference in Liverpool? So earlier on in the, in the programme, we heard from Keir Starmer, we heard from Rachel Reeves, but delegates in Liverpool um, also heard from the party's deputy leader, Angela Rayner. What did Angela Rayner say? Yes, Adam, Angela Rayner kick-started the conference, if you like, on the opening day. Now, as deputy leader, she has her own mandate, but she also has several other roles within the party. And on the Sunday, her main role really was to rally the troops, to get them going ahead of the week ahead. Uh, but there was also some policy substance too. Now, um, you and I keep abreast of Labour Party reshuffles and we'll have noticed that recently she was moved to shadow the local government um, levelling up brief. And that means housing. And in her speech, she talked about the biggest expansion of affordable and social housing in a generation. It was a wide ranging speech. Let's see how it went down. From our elected mayors to our local authority leaders or the Labour government in Wales, our movement has never been so unified, so focused around one aim, to give Britain its future back. But the Tories also have one singular focus, to desperately cling on to power. That's why the Tories' levelling up project was dead on arrival. You cannot level up from the top down. The Tories only know how to centralise power and hold wealth where it benefits them. And it's under their watch, the places that once built Britain have been abandoned. Communities crumbling, high streets emptying, rising crime. Streets that were once bursting with pride, shut down, boarded up, denied a brighter future, rents that are skyrocketing, mortgages soaring, where work doesn't pay. It's that lingering sense that Britain is broken. Collateral damage from the swing of the Tories' wrecking ball. There's no doubt we need to raise the floor on wages and build lasting change. But it's only Labour that can make that work. <laughs> With a genuine living wage that working people can actually live on. We will change the low pay commission's remit so that the minimum wage will for the first time take account of the cost of living. Conference, and I've heard some rumours that we'll be watering down our new deal for working people. Be in no doubt, not with Keir and I at the helm. We will ban zero hour contracts, end fire and rehire, and give workers rights from day one. We'll go further and faster in closing the gender pay gap. Make work more 
more family friendly and tackle sexual harassment and we won't stop there. We know a secure home is like a secure job, is a game changer and crucial foundation for a good life. That's why we will get social homes built, brick by brick, brick, building not just homes, but also communities. And I'll get my hard hat and high vis on if I have to. I pledge to you today, Keir and I will deliver the biggest boost in affordable and social housing for a generation. A conference that includes council housing. Labour's Deputy Leader Angela Rayner. Now, David, obviously the NHS is going to be a big issue at the next election, a waiting list that's more than 7 million people long. Um, one of the final speeches at the Labour Party conference was from the Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting. He was pretty tough. What did he say so toughly? It was a very interesting speech. Now, the chances are that if Labour do win the election, they will inherit... Uh, a massive waiting list backlog. They've come up with some ideas for tackling it, getting NHS staff to uh, work weekends and, and so on. But it's clearly going to take more than that if they're going to achieve their aim, which is to eliminate that backlog uh, within five years. Now, although there will be a little extra money uh, for that, as we'll hear in a moment, it was interesting, quite striking, I thought, that both Keir Starmer and Wes Street Streeting uh, were talking about reform, not just pouring money into the NHS. Quite a change of tone, I thought, from previous Labour conferences. And West Streeting telling delegates that the NHS must simply modernise or die. I'm blunt about the fact that the NHS is no longer the envy of the world, not to undermine it, but to reassure people that we've noticed. I argue that our NHS must modernise or die, not as a threat, but a choice. The crisis really is that existential. When I look at leading health systems across the world, the fundamental problem with the NHS becomes obvious. We have an NHS that gets to people too late. A hospital-based system geared towards late diagnosis and treatment, delivering poorer outcomes at greater cost. An analogue system in a digital age, a sickness service, not a health service, with too many lives hampered by preventable illness and too many lives lost to the biggest killers. So be in no doubt about the scale of the challenge. Not just because as waiting lists rise, public confidence falls, but because in the longer term, the challenge of rising chronic disease combined with our ageing society threatens to bankrupt our NHS. The Tories' answer is all sticking plasters in the short term, but an abandonment of the NHS in the longer term. As we saw in Manchester last week, the Conservative Party dances to the tune of Nigel Farage now, and the more they move to the right, the greater their threat to our NHS becomes. So it falls to us, the party that founded the NHS 75 years ago, to rescue, rebuild and renew our health service today. And we will. To answer the historic calling of our founders, Labour's reform agenda will turn the NHS on its head. From hospital to community, analogue to digital, sickness to prevention, a neighbourhood health service as much as a national health service, pioneering cutting-edge treatment and technology, preventing ill health, not just treating it. At the general election, when they ask, why Labour? You tell them. Two million more appointments a year to cut waiting lists. 700,000 more appointments with NHS dentists. Mental health support in every school. Mental health hubs in every community. Double the number of scanners. The biggest expansion of NHS staff in history. More doctors, more nurses, more midwives. An NHS that's there for you when you need it. Back on its feet and fit for the future. So let's go out there. Let's give Britain its hope back. 
Let's give Britain its NHS back together with Keir Starmer. Let's get Britain, get Britain its future back. That's what we're doing. Thank you. And one of the reasons Wes Streeting was slightly losing his voice at the end there wasn't just the rousing rhetoric, it was the fact he was in karaoke the night before and a very good singer he is as well. Um, now, David, before we go, um, Parliament is back in a couple of days' time after this, this conference recess that it's had, a bit of time off for MPs. What's, what's on the agenda already? Yes, Adam, MPs and peers uh, back at Westminster on Monday, possibly not for long with the end of the parliamentary year in sight and the King's speech. Now on Monday, MPs are going to expect to hear from James Cleverley, the Foreign Secretary, about the situation in the Middle East. Uh, the Foreign Secretary has been there. He wants to stand shoulder to shoulder uh, with Israel. Uh, he's also likely to face plenty of questions about what is obviously a fast changing situation and um, the government's role, uh, both in terms of international diplomacy. Uh, we know that uh, the government has been uh, repatriating some British nationals, laying on flights there. Uh, but also, I think, closer to home, really, keeping communities safe here. Uh, and anything else? Well, MPs and peers have been away for three weeks, and a lot can happen in politics in three weeks, as you know. Um, a lot of catching up to do, so I think we can expect a, a statement or an urgent question on the decision to cancel the northern leg of HS2, announced at the Conservative Party conference in Manchester. Um, also, Rishi Sunak's decision to move the goalposts a little on uh, net zero. Now, that was announced in a press conference, and the Speaker of the Commons, Lindsay Hoyle, was so incensed by that, he said if he'd had the power to recall MPs that Friday, he'd have brought them back to Westminster and brought the government back to, uh, to answer questions. So um, we'll see if Lindsay Hoyle has calmed down a little in the last fortnight or so. I suspect not. Just such a reminder that politics does not stop hurtling along at 100 miles an hour, even when Parliament isn't sitting for people and people can skulk around in cor corridors plotting things. Um, now, sometimes people say, oh, it's the end of party conference season, forgetting that the Scottish National Party is having its conference this weekend. It starts on Sunday. It's in Aberdeen. I mean, Hamza Youssef, the First Minister and SNP party leader, has got, got quite a tricky hand at the moment, hasn't he? There's all the stuff going on with, with the SNP and Nicola Sturgeon. Um, uh, there's the, the rumbles about actually where do they go with the campaign for independence now? And then they lost the, the, the Rutherglen by-election, like spectacularly to Labour a couple of days ago. And, of course, the last SNP uh, conference before the expected general election, an election in which, if you look at the polls, suggests the SNP could lose a few seats. As you say, they lost the uh, Rutherglen and Hamilton West by election. In the run-up to their conference, Lisa Cameron, an MP, has defected to the Conservatives, um, to the glee of both the Tories and Scottish Labour, it should be said, um, who think that her defection uh, proves a point. So it's been a baptism of fire for Hamza Youssef, but he does get the chances in his leader speech to control the narrative, set out where the SNP are going, and uh, try and calm all that unrest in the ranks. I have to say, having been to Labour and the Tories conferences, you just get that sense it's all about kind of honing the message down to kind of get themselves general election ready. The issue for the Conservative Party is there was still quite a lot of arguments about what the Conservative Party stands for, which I think is maybe a bit of a political risk for Rishi Sunak when it comes to getting that honed down message out there. But mm. the election could still be could still be like more than a year away, and that's a long, long, long time. It could be in January 2025, but I don't think anyone thinks it, they're going to <laughs> go on for that long. You may be relieved to hear. Interesting at the Labour conference, what a 20-point lead can do to both the confidence uh, um, mm. and the way it brought uh, business corporates uh, to the conference to hear people who they think could be in a power in a while. Also, it does wonders for party discipline, doesn't it? everybody on their best behaviour. Mm. Doesn't always happen like that at party conferences. Confidence or hubris? We will find out. David, thank you very much. Uh, and that's all for this edition of Politics UK. Joe Coburn will be back with more Politics Live on Monday, which, of course, is at 12.15 on BBC Two and also on iPlayer. Bye. <laughs>